Good morning, Pace. I wonder if there's anybody in Florida that loves Jesus. I'm going to try that one more time. I wonder if there's anybody in Florida who's radically in love on fire from the tip of your toes to the top of your head, burning for Jesus. Well, it's an honor to be with you guys today and be with our dear friends, uh, Joey and Rita Rogers, some of the greatest preachers and pastors in America. I told Pastor Joy, I said, this is the last time I'm coming to Pace if you don't come to Cookville, Tennessee and preach. And so it's such an honor to be with him and to be with you. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed uh, this morning. I've been trying to figure out what kind of friend Pastor Joy is to me and how good of a friend I am to him for him to put me behind Bill Federer and Brother Kenley. And they graduated Laude, cum laude, summa cum laude. I graduated, thank you, laude. And, uh, they got all kinds of degrees. You look on their webpage, you see all these accolades and television shows and people that they've been around. And you look on my webpage and I kind of feel like a, a plow mule following two racehorses right now. And so, uh, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Today, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about prophetic patterns that are reemerging in our time. I want you to take your Bibles out with me this morning or find a Bible. I'm not going to have anything on the screen. What I am going to have for you is my notes. You can download my notes. They're going to put a QR code on the screen for you. You can download my notes and get everything that I'm going to share with you because there's no way in the world you're going to be able to keep up with me for the next few minutes. But I want us to go together to the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll start there. Ecclesiastes, and I want to look at chapter 1, and then I want to look at chapter 3. Wow, the last two sessions have been powerful. I, uh, I'm going to have to figure out how to get uh, Brother Federer's presentation. My mind was rolling about things. Just powerful, powerful. And then Brother Kenley doing such a, an incredible job magnifying Jesus to us. I want to pray and ask the Lord to help us for a few minutes. I'm going to try to drop some pretty heavy things on you, and you're going to have to listen, not just with your physical ears, but with your spiritual ears this morning. Father, I'm so honored to be standing right here in this moment. I believe that I'm here for such a time as this. I pray three things, Lord. First of all, I pray, Father, that you would forgive me today of anything that I've done, said, or thought that would hinder you from speaking through me. I pray secondly, Lord, that you would fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. Nothing supernatural will happen in this room unless there's an anointing here that destroys the yoke. So give us the power of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, Lord, I pray that you would flow through me to these people, that you would give them ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us to prepare us for this prophetic moment that we're living in. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen and amen. Ecclesiastes chapter one, that which, I want to look at verse number nine, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. I want you to notice those words again. That which has been is what will be. Say that out loud with me, please. That which has been is what will be. Come on, I know you're a spirit-filled church, so I want you to say it like you know it's the Bible. That which has been is what will be. Then he says, that which is done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. 
But here's the problem in verse number 11. Even though that which has been is that which shall be, that it's all, whatever takes place in our time has already taken place in an ancient time. Verse number 11, he says, there's no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come by those who will come after. That is the problem. I want you to turn with me now to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three. Because the wisest man who ever lived felt it important to remind us of the cycle of history twice. In verse number 15, that which is has already been. And what is to be has already been. God requires an account of what is past. The Roman world looked at time and we're gonna talk about in my last session, I'm gonna talk about three prophetic turning points that all of us are gonna to have to deal with at this prophetic season that we're living in. But the Roman world looks at time as very linear, a beginning and end, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock rock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock rock. Some of my Happy Days fans know what I'm talking about and you're dating yourself. However, the Greeks and the Eastern world in particular does not look at time as linear. They look at time as more cyclical, cyclical. And even though in the Greek language you have two Greek words for time, one being chronos, which is the measurement of time in a linear fashion, you also have kairos, which is appointment times, as if there's something divine from the world of the gods breaking into time. When the Bible describes God, Jesus as the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, you've got to understand that to a Jewish person who's reading that, they would transliterate that into Hebrew. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Tav, pictorial Hebrew, when you put them together, actually makes an unbroken circle. So when the Bible is saying, or Jesus is saying that he is the Alpha and the Omega, in the mind of the Hebrew reader, what it was saying is that God is eternal. Psalm 90, verse number two, God says, from everlasting to everlasting, I am he. Our God has no beginning, has no ending. Our God sets above time. We're gonna talk about this in the last session, yet he breaks into time. And so time that God created for his purposes has this cyclical thing to it. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, that which has been is that which shall be. In other words, there are patterns all throughout time. There are two ways to prophetically have x-ray vision, as Brother Kenley talked about. You and I ought to be prophetic people. And when I say prophetic people, I'm not talking about the kind of people who always have a tongue and interpretation of tongue or some weird word that we give from time to time, even though I believe that those are gifts of the Holy Spirit meant for us in the last days. But when I say that we should be prophetic people, I mean more in the sense that we are like the sons of Issachar, that we should be able to look at the times and the seasons and to know where we are in the plan of God and what God is, wants us to do in that moment. Nothing ever occurs to God and never they ever takes God by surprise. So why are the people of God always shocked about occurrences that are happening in the earth, why shouldn't we be led by the Holy Ghost to know? By the way, the Bible says one of the, one of the rules or one of the, the, the main jobs or roles of the Holy Spirit is to show us things to come. But why is it that church people seem to never know what is coming? We should know what is coming. One of the ways for us to have a prophetic sense about us, about prophetic days, I, I, I believe with all my heart that you and I are that generation upon which the ends of the world have come. 
I believe with all my heart that the next great event of human history is the catching away of the church. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise and then you and I which are alive will rise up to meet them in the air and so shall we ever believe with the Lord. Is there anybody in this room that still believes that Jesus is coming? Well, if we are that close to the coming of the Lord, there should be a prophetic sense about us, about the moment in which we live. So how do we have or sharpen this prophetic sense? Well, one of the ways that we do that is we understand how prophecy works, how time works, how that time is cyclical and that there are prophetic patterns. So for the next few minutes, what I wanna do is I wanna build a little foundation by looking at some of the prophetic patterns of scripture. Then I wanna go into some of the prophetic patterns of history. And then I wanna deal with a prophetic pattern that is reemerging as you and I are sitting here in this room that I believe that nobody is paying attention to. I believe that this prophetic pattern that I'm gonna show you in just a moment that is reemerging in our time that should be a wake up call to every single one of us that something that God is up to something in this moment. I believe that we're overlooking it because we just don't pay attention to history very much. So let me, for the next few minutes, just talk about some prophetic patterns. For example, many of you have heard this before, but I wanna just bring it to you again and just kinda of draw some things from it, but there's prophetic patterns all through the scripture. For example, in Genesis chapter one, two, and three, God creates everything, everything's beautiful, there's trees that, lie, uh, that are in the garden, there's beautiful rivers that are flowing through the garden, there's the tree of life that is in the garden, we know that man messes that up, but you go to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and once again, we have a garden. We have trees. We have the river of life. Something that's interesting in the scripture is that in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, you have the mention of Babylon, 17 being spiritual Babylon, 18 being more of a physical Babylon. But the first time you hear the mention of Babylon is Genesis chapter 11. But I just wanna draw your attention to some patterns here for just a moment. If you back up from Genesis chapter 11, the next major event going backwards toward Genesis chapter one, you find yourself in Genesis chapter six, which is when God is destroying the earth with a flood, judging the earth with a flood. So judgment comes. Then you go to Genesis 11 and there is Babylon. Well, we know that there's a catching away, the type and shadow of Noah in the ark and the catching away, uh, uh, the saving of a people, a remnant from judgment. Then judgment is released after the rapture of the church. Revelation chapter four, we get into the tribulation period, Revelation 17, 18, there's Babylon. But if you back on up, again, there are these patterns that are all through the scripture like this that that which has been is that which shall be, for there's nothing new under the sun. For example, if you go to Genesis chapter five, the first genealogy of your Bible, there are 10 names all going all the way from Adam to Noah in the first genealogy of the Bible in, in Genesis chapter five. 3,500 years ago, these names were recorded. Now, you have a, a Bible teacher that has astute enough to teach you that in the Hebraic culture, you don't name somebody because that's the most popular name floating around on the internet at the moment. In the Hebraic culture, when you name somebody, you name them with a prophetic sense and it's almost like you're prophesying destiny over their life. So the names that are mentioned, the first genealogy mentioned in Genesis chapter five, these 10, ten names, carry weight in Hebraic meaning. For example, Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enos means mortal, Canaan means sorrow, Mahilalil means blessed God, Jared means shall come down, Enoch means teaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, Lamech means despairing, and Noah means rest. 
These are the first 10 names of the first genealogy. The first, everybody say the first. The first genealogy, the first 10 names of those genealogy in your Bible written 3,500 years ago and they have a meaning. What, what's, what's interesting, if you take the meaning of these names, put them together in sentence form, here's what it says. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. So notice in the first genealogy of the Bible, the first 10 names of that genealogy, you have the fall of man all the way to the redemptive work of man through the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel is found. So watch, God hides the future in the past. Now it doesn't stop there if you take the genealogy of Genesis chapter five. And then you go over to Genesis chapter 11 and you combine those two genealogies together, you find out that it records from the birth of Adam to the birth of Abraham. This is Genesis chapter five, three to Genesis chapter 11, verse number 26. From Adam to Abraham in these genealogies, putting Genesis five and Genesis 11 together, you will find yourself totaling up 1,948 years. Now, why is that important? Because Abraham is considered to be the first Jew because he was the first to cross the Jordan River. He's also considered to be the father of the nation of Israel. Why is 1948 significant? Well, from the carrying away of Babylon, uh, carrying away into Babylonian captivity, Israel did not exist as a sovereign nation at all until May the 15th, 1948, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, could a nation be born in a day? So a notice, could it be that God was actually recording what was gonna happen in the future just in the first genealogies of your Bible in Genesis chapter five, uh, in Genesis chapter 11? So. Again, what I'm trying to show you is God requires the future of the past. There's patterns that are all throughout the word of God. For example, let me give you a pattern or a parallel between Israel and Jesus. We know that Jesus fulfilled the plan of God for the nation of Israel in every way. Look at these prophetic patterns for just a moment. Israel is born in Canaan. Jesus is born in Canaan. Israel moved to Egypt to escape death. Then Genesis chapter 46, verse six. Jesus moved to Egypt to escape death. Matthew chapter two, verse number 13. Israel began conquest after crossing the Jordan River. Jesus began his ministry after crossing the Jordan River. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. There's 12 tribes under the leadership of, the Moses, of Moses and Joshua in the wilderness. There is 12 disciples under the leadership of the Lord Jesus. Joshua died and left the elders in charge of Israel. Jesus left his disciples to carry out his work on the earth. What I'm trying to show you is these patterns are all through the word of God. I'm going somewhere with all this, so let me just... Dig a little deeper. Can I dig a little deeper for a moment? There's patterns like this that show us the future. Just in the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus is born, of course, there's Mary, the mother. But when Jesus is dying, there's another Mary, Mary Magdalene, standing at the foot of the cross. When Jesus is born, there is his father by adoption, Joseph, but when Jesus is dying, there's another Joseph there, Joseph of Arimathea. And we could go on and on. There are actually 33 types and shadows or cyclical things just in the 33 years of Jesus' life on the earth mentioned in the four gospels alone. When we talk about the tribulation that is to come, you can find what's gonna happen in the tribulation all through the book of Revelation by looking at the life of Elijah the prophet. 
Elijah and the tribulation, both of them have 42 months of judgment. Both of them have 42 months of no rain. There's famine in the land. There's food rationing. The the brooks and the rivers are drying up. There's remnants that are hiding out in caves. There's fire falling from heaven. There's false religion in both of them. There's thousands of people who have not bowed. There are people who are caught up into heaven. What I'm trying to tell you is that the end is revealed in the beginning. And there's all kinds of patterns like this all through the word of God. So there's biblical patterns. But not only are there biblical patterns, there's historical patterns. So I had a friend years ago that used to teach this. He said, if you get the pattern right, the glory will fall. And one of the ways you try to determine what God is going to do in the future is by studying patterns. So you need to know your Bible. You need to know biblical patterns, but it it would be great to know history. I think uh, Bill Federer amplified that to all of us this morning better than I could ever do by going back into history to show you how history is constantly repeating itself over and over again. Let me give you another Historic, let's go to a historical pattern. Let me take a moment and let's just talk about this profound prophetic connection and parallel between Israel and America. If you look just alone at, at Columbus and his voyage to America and you kind of compare it to Israel, let me just give you some things. Did you know that Columbus's voyage to the New World began on the 10th of Aviv? The Hebrew month Aviv, it was originally set for the ninth, but they feared bad luck. Now many scholars believe that the reason that Columbus did not sail on the ninth of Aviv, but waited to the 10th is because it has been determined that Columbus was probably a Jew. And it was during the Spanish Inquisition, all throughout his journals, he quotes scripture. He quotes scripture claiming that he is fulfilling the promise of God by finding a safe haven land for the Jewish people. At the same time in Spain, there's a Spanish Inquisition pushing the Jewish people out of Spain. He is signing it with Jewish uh, signatures all through it. So could it be that maybe the reason he didn't go on the ninth of Av is because every major attack that has ever happened in the land of Israel has always occurred. Many of them have occurred on the night of Aviv. And so he holds off to the tent because he knows something. He doesn't want the bad luck of that day. Let me just show you something. 10 weeks later, after Columbus voyaged to the new world, 10 weeks later, he arrived at San Salvador on the 21st of Tishri, the Hebrew month Tishri. This just happens to be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles that commemorated the Jews wandering through the wilderness and finding a promised land. I believe that the fact that Columbus um, discovered a land that would offer safety to the Jews on this date is not an accident because the past is foretelling the future. In fact, did you know that on May the 14th, 1607, settlers landed in present-day Virginia, established the first permanent English colony, Jamestown, May the 14th. May the 14th is significant because it was the same day that in 1948 that Israel was reborn as a nation. Isn't it interesting that God would tie these two nations together? Now, I don't care what you think about that or not. It doesn't really matter to me what you believe or not, but I believe that there is a divine providence over the nation of Israel and uh, and over America, and we need to be careful that we do not side against God's chosen people and God's chosen land. Now, on April 19th, 1775, the English colonists were under the tyranny of England, and on this date, the American Revolution started with something called the shot that was heard around the world. This small army of farmers faced the most powerful military might in the world. Israel faced the exact same thing when they were coming out of bondage and God delivered them by passing through the land one night on Passover. One night on Passover. 
Did you know that April the 19th, 1775 just happened to fall on Passover on the Hebrew calendar? So the same night, same uh, calendar day that God liberated the nation of Israel, God also liberated America from British rule. Folks, this is not an accident. What is happening? I'm trying to show you that God is requiring the future of the past, that which has been. And there's not just biblical patterns that reemerge all the time. There are secular or historical patterns that reemerge all the time. There is one that is coming. We know that Hitler persecuted the Jewish people. Did you know that the uh, tribulation period is oftentimes called Jacob's trouble? It's always troubled me why it's called Jacob's trouble. Because when you study your Bible, you understand that Jacob's trouble was not seven years, but 14. Right? Y'all remember, Jacob worked for seven years to get his wife, Rachel. Didn't open his eyes when he kissed her at the altar. Woke up the next morning beside Leah. Had to work another seven years for Rachel. So Jacob's trouble is actually 14 years. Yet the tribulation period that is to come is called Jacob's trouble. Why is that? Because it's only seven years. Could it be that God actually is hiding a pattern in history? Did you know that the Jewish people under Nazi rule, was, they were persecuted for exactly seven years under Nazi rule? Did you know that the last three and a half years of Hitler's rule was called the final solution. Isn't that interesting? The last three and a half years of the tribulation period will be called great tribulation. When you look at Hitler and you compare him to the Antichrist that is to come, both of them have insignificant beginnings. Hitler's a military and political leader, so is the Antichrist. Hitler has a propaganda minister, so does the Antichrist. He's called the false prophet. Hitler allies with Mussolini, Rome, so does the false prophet. Hitler persecutes the Jews seven years. There's seven years of tribulation period. Hitler has a mark called the swastika. So does the Antichrist. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Hitler influenced Southern and Eastern Europe. The Bible says the Antichrist will be great to the south and the east. Hitler, when he died, his body was thrown into the fire. Thank God the Bible says one day, whenever Jesus comes, he's going to take the body of the Antichrist. He'll be thrown into the lake of fire. That which has been is that which shall be, for there's nothing new under the sun. So there's all kinds of biblical patterns, and then there's all kinds of historical patterns. Let me give you one more historical pattern before I show you something that's reemerging in our time that I've heard nobody talk about. I'm going to take a risk this morning at sounding absolutely nuts. But I think I'm seeing something that could be concerning for all of us. When you compare Lincoln and Kennedy did you know that there are 27 prophetic correlations, similarities that defy mathematical probability? I've studied this for years, and the more I study it, the more I find, and I finally had to quit studying it because it was getting to me. But let me give you an example of a historical pattern that plays out in the realm of politics. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John F. Kennedy was elected to Congress exactly 100 years long, uh, later. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. Kennedy was elected in 1960. Both of them have seven letters in their last name. Both of the assassins have 15 letters in their names. 
both of the assassins are known by three names, not just two names. Both Kennedy and Lincoln are slain on a Friday. Both of them have three children alive in the White House, and while they're in the White House, both of them lose a child. Both of them, the main issue of their presidency is civil rights and liberty. Both of them, their elections were contested. Lincoln has a secretary named Kennedy. Kennedy has a secretary named Lincoln. Lincoln is warned, do not go to the theater. You could be assassinated. Kennedy is warned, do not go to Dallas. You could be assassinated. Lincoln has a successor, the vice president named Johnson. Kennedy has a successor, same vice president, last name rather, Johnson. Andrew Johnson is born in 1808. Lyndon Baines Johnson is born in 1908. Both of these vice presidents were Southern Democrats. Lincoln is shot in a theater and the killer hides in the warehouse. Kennedy is shot from a warehouse and the killer hides in a theater. <laughs> Lincoln is shot in a Ford theater. Kennedy is shot in a Lincoln automobile. Both the assassins are killed before the trial. And I could go on and on with this for about 20 more. Folks, these things defy mathematical probability. Again, what I'm trying to do this morning is just to show you that that which has been is that which shall be, for there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, in the book of Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, am I boring you? Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, Isaiah the, uh, God says through Isaiah, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there's no one else. I'm God and there's none like me. I declare the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things which are not yet done, saying that my counsel will stand and I will do my pleasure. God says, remember the old things. When God creates folks, he doesn't create like you and I. We create at the beginning and we work toward an end. God goes to the end of the matter. We're gonna talk about this at the last session that I do. Don't miss the last session. I'm telling you, it'll help you more than anything I could teach you. But God goes to the end of the matter and he cre creates back toward the beginning. Again, nothing ever occurs to God. Nothing ever catches God by surprise because God knows the end from the beginning. Now, why did I do what I did? Because I wanted to make sure that I held President Lincoln and President Kennedy. Because one of the greatest um, trauma points of our nation was when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. John F. Kennedy. Now, I'm going to digress for a moment. Just hold that thought in your mind about Kennedy. Kennedy. Back 12 years ago, I was sitting in my living room. It was late at night. I was watching television. I was living in West Monroe, Louisiana, and we had just come through Katrina. And so we were all picking up the pieces. At that moment, that night, all of a sudden on my television set, I saw a person that was a newscaster, it, it, it went to like a, a breaking story, you know, like you would see on Fox, a breaking news alert. The whole television changes, there's a newscaster on there and says there is something that is developing over America that's devastating and they go into this whole newscast and they put up a picture of a storm. It looked like a hurricane. It looked just like Katrina, except this, this storm was moving across the heartland of America. It was dead over the center of America. The storm went all the way to the Canada border, all the way down to the southern border, and it was moving across America. Now, having come through Katrina, when I saw this, immediately I, I sat at the end of my chair because I, my team and my staff was down in the streets of New Orleans rescuing people out of their houses. 
And immediately I start thinking to myself, oh God, what am I going to do? It's in the middle of the night. What am I going to do? How, uh, should, I, should I send out alert to all of my staff and should I get them out of bed? We need to get prepared because this, this was happening to me. So in my, in my, I was awake. I was not asleep. I was awake. I'm thinking this is really taking place. About that time I heard the newscaster say, we have a person who's on location in the storm. Immediately they went to this individual. The wind is jostling this person around and things are flying around his head and he's talking about the wind of this storm that is coming across America, that he's never seen anything like it, that this is unlike anything he had ever been a part of. And he reaches down on the ground like this and he grabs some of this debris and he holds it up in his hand and it's $100 bills and $1 bills. He said, this is not a storm of anything like I've ever seen before. He said, this is a storm of money. Immediately when he said that, I was sitting on the couch Sitting behind me, over my right shoulder, I heard these words. They divided my land, now I will divide theirs. Now, you, you read in the prophet of Ezekiel about God coming down and reaching and grabbing Ezekiel by the hair of the head and snatching him up. That didn't happen to me. So I don't know where he grabbed me. But he snatched me up. And in a moment, the whole scene changed for me and I find myself sitting in a room in the Middle East. And I'm sitting up against the wall and around the table are all the heads of these various nations and sitting at the head of the table is Putin. And I hear them discussing at the table how they're going to destroy America. And I thought, this is so odd, you know, because at, th at this point I still haven't put two and two together that I'm having a vision. And by the way, I've never had another one. I I'm very leery of anybody that says I had a vision every week. Because this thing scared me to death. I don't ever want to have another one. And... I'm sitting in there and I'm listening to these leaders, these world leaders, and they're talking about the destruction of America and they're saying, this is how we're going to do it. And Putin said, we're going to form an alliance. Now, before I tell you this, I want you to know I wrote this in a book, The Last Days of America, in 2012 and even said it would start in 2020. I said, November of 2020, what you're seeing will begin to, what I'm saying will begin to unfold. So, I'm not telling you something after the fact. I'm talking about prophetically, living prophetically. Are y'all still here? They're talking about trading oil away from the dollar. They said, America's currency is no longer backed up by the gold standard. And what we will do is we will trade our currency or we will create a currency and trade oil away from the American dollar. And as soon as we do that, American dollar ceases to be the world's currency. And here's exactly what they said. They said America will not experience a, re a, re a recession. They will not even experience another depression they will not know how to respond because they will actually experience the collapse of the dollar. Amen. Sitting around this table were the BRIC nations. This is all in my book. I wrote it in 2012. One of them said, when will we do this? And he said, we will begin our strategy in November of 2020. Immediately, I was jerked out of that room and I was sitting back on the couch and I was watching the television and all of a sudden in America, I saw war in the streets, violence in the streets, people fighting and burning and looting buildings and races fighting each other and I was going from city to city. 
I saw a great earthquake hit the New Madrid Fault. And people have asked me, do you believe this is a literal earthquake? I said, I don't know if it's a literal earthquake, but what I f saw was I saw a line run down the miracle of America and it separated the north from the south. And I felt like in my spirit when I saw it that there was gonna be something that would divide the races. And again, we would go backwards in time. And again, the Lord spoke over my right shoulder. He said, they divided my land, now I will divide their land. I had no idea that what I had a vision of in 2012, in 2020, would start unfolding and that I would now be standing here in 2023 talking about five nations called the BRIC nations who have now formed an alliance that starts the 30th of September trading away from the American dollar. By the way, these five BRIC nations control 67% of the world's economy right now. They have already let it out that next year they're going to bring in another five nations that will control over 85% of the world's economy. Five and five is 10. Could we be seeing the formation of the ten-toed nation mentioned in Daniel, out of which a little horn, the Antichrist, arises, who has the power to control buying and selling. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm bringing this to you right now is because prophetic patterns are unraveling in our day. And we're not even realizing the prophetic season that we're living in. Christians better start learning how to be led by the Holy Ghost to know what they ought to do in every single thing. Somebody asked me the other day, so what, I, what do I do about my money? How are you gonna protect it? You gonna invest in gold? Well, silver, well, we've had gold and silver seizures. Yeah, you can melt some down, you can put it in a block somewhere in the room, but as soon as you need some food and you have to chip it off the block, then they're gonna record it. Most people don't know this. Did you know that in most states that it, it is a law if you own a pawn shop, somebody trades gold to you, you have to register it in most states so they can track it? What I'm telling you folks is you and I are living in prophetic days and we need to get ready. That's why this conference is so important. So, let me give you a prophetic pattern that is re-emerging right now, and then I'm going to close with the scripture, because I'm hungry. <laughs> John F. Kennedy. Say that out loud. John F. Kennedy. You need to keep your eyes on Robert Kennedy, yes. Jr., now, let me just say, I'm not espousing him as a candidate. I could espouse him as a candidate if he didn't believe in abortion up to three months. Outside of that, he believes everything I believe. However, did you know that Robert Kennedy Jr. went to get his master's? And do you know what his master's study was on? The Black Coat Regiment. The Black Coat Regiment. During the Revolutionary War, it was a group of pastors who would ascend to the pulpit in black coats and would stir the people to fight for liberty. And he studied that. Sixty years ago, his uncle, John F. Kennedy, and a few years later, his daddy, Bobby Kennedy, were assassinated. 60. 60. Why is 60 so important? Did you know that um, Isaac had Jacob at 60? Did you know that the word Sabbath is mentioned 60 times in your Bible? Did you know that 60 in Jewish culture 
is the year or the, the number of the fulfillment or the reaping of what has been sown. Even in far eastern culture, in eastern mysticism, 60, another term for 60 is karma. Now, you have a candidate that the secular media, even though he's a Democrat, won't pay any attention to. And they hate him. So that tells me this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a conservative versus a liberal issue. He's calling out the CIA. Claiming that he has proof that the CIA killed his uncle and his daddy. He says there's over 90,000 documents that have already been judicially released to the American public about JFK's uh, assassination, but the government has not allowed any of those documents to come to the public. He's saying, if I get in office or get in power, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna release all of those documents to the public for they can see that the CIA is responsible. He just recently did an interview with Tucker Carlson where he made the statement that the CIA was responsible for overturning 82 national governments, almost all of which, two of them, were democratic. That they're not democratic, they're not for democracy, they're for coup d'etats. He's calling out the FBI. He's calling out the Department of Justice. I want to tell you something, and you need to be praying. The spirit of assassination is on the loose. That same spirit that moved 60 years ago. By the way, do you think it's a coincidence that the day that his uncle was killed happens to be the day of the first democratic debate? Now, I could go on and on with all of this, but I'm simply telling you the last major trauma point of our nation was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And now all of a sudden, you've got another Kennedy coming to the forefront in America and call it, listen, making statements like this, that America's responsible for the war in Ukraine. Not the Russians. And giving proof of it and calling people on the carpet, calling out the CIA. And by the way, did you know that he appealed to the White House because he has more death threats than Obama, Trump, or Biden have ever received, and he's not even a candidate yet? More death threats. He appealed to the White House to have Secret Service protection, which almost every person gets 300 days prior to an election. And recently, Biden denied him Secret Service protection. So here he is out here with no protection at all, saying the things that he's saying calling these government, and, and we have secular media that is against him as much as they're against any conservative. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you that if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I think there's a prophetic pattern emerging Amen. that you and I need to pay very close attention to. Again, I'm not saying I want him as president or I, that's not my goal. My thing is just to show you that there's these kinds of patterns. Now, well, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? And what in the world am I going to do in the days in which we live? I'm going to give you one past scripture, and everybody's going to have to turn there now. I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I don't know why 
I see some of this strange stuff because I don't go looking for it. Contrary to what people think, I don't sit around studying it. Amen. It makes me nuts. Amen. Right? I like to fish. <laughs> but sometimes I've just learned to be sensitive to some things. We were just in uh, Loosedale, Mississippi, and Rick, my pilot, who helps me get around, was, was there with me. And there was a man I was preaching. There was a man sitting right here, Pastor. His name was George. I looked at him. I said, what's your name? He said, George. While I'm preaching, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just began to move in me. I said, George, stand up. I said, George, what if I told you that there's an angel of healing that's touching your back right now? He took off running, shouting. I said, you should have been dead twice. And he said, I, sh I died twice. And God raised him from the dead twice out of accidents. And I said, but the enemy couldn't kill you. You know you should have been dead twice. I said, but George, I see that like Job, he lost his children. And I see you have suffered two great losses. He started wailing. He said, there's no way you could have known that. I said, what happened? He said, my wife and I went camping with our kids. We were both partying and drunk. We crawled in the tent. We went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and my kids were gone. And he said, I ran down to the river and I, I dived into the river and swam around till I found both of my babies hanging in a tree. They were dead. And God did a healing work. And you could tell this brother right here had been through some. In fact, I found out he was all through in and out of prison and all kinds of stuff, murdering people and all kinds of crazy stuff. And God did a healing, restoring work. Let me tell you something. If God knows that about George, God knows everything that he needs to do about the future of our life. Amen? So I'm going to give you my secret. Can I give you my secret? I'm asked, how, how do you get stuff like that? Here it is. Here it is. This is the story about Abraham taking Isaac up on the mountain. Watch. Here's a prophetic pattern in which God hides the future. Isaac is a young man, type and shadow of Christ. He carries wood up a mountain. Christ carries the cross up a mountain. The mountain he carries the wood up is Moriah. The site where the cross is on Golgotha is the mountains of Moriah. The Bible says Abraham lifts up his eyes and sees the place on the third day. Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected on the third day. God said he would provide a lamb, even though a ram was caught in thicket. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. So again, Abraham, what he was doing was a prophetic pattern about something in the future. Y'all with me? Check this out. Verse number one, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, said to, Ab said to Abraham, and Abraham said, here am I. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. Jesus is the only begotten son of the father. Whom you love, go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, Isaac the son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose, watch now, and he went to the place of which God had told him. So here, first of all, God says, I'm gonna show you the place but he gets up and goes to the place. How did Abraham know where the place was? Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And then he tells, just everybody look right here. He looks at his young man and says, y'all stay here. Me and the lad are gonna go worship together and we shall come back. 
Now, over in the New Testament, we know that Abraham was a man of faith. And the Bible says that Abraham would have offered Isaac, even if he would have killed him, he believed. He already in faith that God would have raised him from the dead. But I believe that Abraham had a little bit of insight into what he was doing. Because the Bible says he looked up and he saw the place afar off. He saw the place afar off. Say that out loud, please. He saw the place. Come on, y'all can do better than that. He saw the place. In Hebrew, the word place there, the place, is ha hamakom. It is one of the rarely known names, covenant names of God in the Old Testament. Like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shaman, Jehovah Nisi, Ha Hamakom. Here's the way the rabbis teach it, that since God is in this place and he's in that place and he's in that place and God is in every place all the time, then he is Ha Hamakom, he is the place. Come on, how many know he's omnipresent? So the way they teach it is he's not just over there and over here and over there. He is there, here and there. He's ha hamakom. So watch this. Abraham lifted up his eyes, watch now, and he saw ha hamakom. Afar off. Now the word afar off there in Hebrew can actually be translated in the future. So notice, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, you're gonna offer him there. And Abraham goes and he lifts up his eyes and he sees Hahamakom afar off in the future. Turns to his young man and says, hey, I want you to know something, we're gonna go to the mountain, we're gonna go worship but we shall come back again. Abraham already knew what was gonna happen before he ever got there, and I'm gonna prove it to you right now. Because he saw Hamakom, God, afar off in the future. So Abraham, on the way up the mountain, Isaac turns and looks at him and says, okay, daddy, you got that weird look in your eye. You're kind of acting crazy. You got a knife in one hand. You're making me carry the wood. Where's the sacrifice? He done put two and two together. Where's the sacrifice? Listen to what Abraham said. Abraham said, God himself will provide the sacrifice. A better translation is God himself shall become or God himself shall be seen. That's actually the better translation. God himself shall become the sacrifice or God himself shall become, in fact he said, God himself will provide the lamb. But how many know that whenever God told him to stop his hand, that there wasn't a lamb caught in the bush. Come on now, there was a ram caught in the bush. So what's Abraham talking about? Did he miss God that God would provide a ram instead of a lamb? He said God himself shall provide the lamb. One translation said God himself shall become the lamb. Abraham is already talking about prophecy. Abraham is already thousands of years into the future. He realizes God, I believe God's already told Abraham, Abraham, this don't have nothing to do with you. You might not understand what you're doing or why you're doing it right now, but I want you to know this don't have nothing to do with you. This is just a prophetic pattern about something that I'm gonna do in the future that's gonna change the whole world. So watch this. Abraham looks up his eyes. He sees God in the future. Now, for those of you who say, I don't believe that he saw the cross in the future, you don't believe the Bible. Because the gospel of John, Jesus said, Abraham desired to see this day and he saw it. So, he'll tell you many times we're traveling. I'll take out a sticky note or a notepad and I'll just start writing names and numbers. He'll say, what are you doing? I'll say, oh, no, God's just giving me these names and numbers. Then I'll go to a place, and I, all of a sudden I'll say, hey, is there somebody here with this name? They stand up. Does this number mean something to you? Yep. Come on. I don't ask for that. Come on. 
But here's what I do. Every day, I spend time in the secret place. Come on. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Can I tell you something, child of God? There is a secret place in God. And you are living in a prophetic day. Listen to me. If you're going to be led by the Holy Ghost, which you have a right to be led by the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to steal away with God. You're going to have to get in God's presence. We need to get back to studying our Bible. We need to get back to our prayer time. We need to get back to getting, setting ourselves aside and sacrificing ourselves and saying to God, God, show us what you're about to do in the future. Because I can't tell you how the mark of the beast is going to play out. Stuff is changing so fast right now, I can't even keep up with it. Are y'all with me? I can't tell you how the mark of the beast is going to play out. I don't know how the one world government is. I don't know how it's going to go with the brick nations. I don't even know what the future of America is. But let me tell you what I do know. I do know a God who knows the end from the beginning. I do know a God that can trip every trap of the devil. Come on, I do know a God who can warn me about things to come. I do know a God that can say, move it from this account to move it to that account. I do know a God that can say, you need to take a left instead of taking a right. I do know a God who can protect me wherever I go. I do know a God who knows the connections I need, has the names of those connect. I do, is there anybody in here believes that you know a God that knows the end from the beginning and can prepare you for what is coming.